Hey, everyone. I am here with Charlie Meacham, a very special guest. Charlie, has his story is just remarkable. We talked about it on the podcast, so you're going to absolutely want to listen to those episodes. Uh, Charlie's website where you can find him is charliemeacham.com. He also has two books. One is called Who's That with Charlie? The other one is called Total Anecdotal. You can get those at his website. And he also is a podcast host. His podcast is called 15 Minutes with Charlie, which I highly recommend going and subscribing to. He's just got so much wisdom and experience. It's just, I have so many things that we could talk about. Charlie, thank you so much for staying to do this with me. I'm uh, delighted to do it. The only downside for me is that when people couldn't see me, um, uh, they didn't realize I was almost 90 years old. Now they'll see this weathered old guy. <laughs> it's the same guy. You don't look a day over 60. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's so great to have you here. And I mean, your story from the minute, like it, it's one of those things where when you tell your story, it, it's just like your jaw hits the ground. Like the person listening, it just keeps <laughs> you hanging on it. Like they should make a movie about your story through life. I think that that would be very entertaining uh, and it would share a lot of wisdom for people. Sure. So have you, th like, obviously in your books, you share that story and in your podcast and all of those things, but like what, in this day, point of your life, um, with what you're doing today, what do you find the most fulfillment in doing these days? Well, my wife and I really uh, enjoy being together. Um, she has shared all of my memories with me. We were married in uh, 1952. So there are a lot of things that that we enjoy together. Oddly enough, this stay at home and hunkering down, we laughed. We said that's what we've been doing for the last five or eight years. Uh, we we listen to a lot of uh, books on tape, which we enjoy. I still read a fair amount of stuff. I uh, I'm I'm uh, obsessed with uh, magazines and newspapers to the point where. Uh, I can't begin to keep up. Uh, I just really enjoy um, the passing scene, if that's the right word. I also am a real history buff, uh, I guess mainly because I've lived through such a large, a large part of it. And we were talking earlier about World War II, although I was only 11 when the war started and uh, 16 when it ended. I still have a lot of memories, apart from the war itself. But in turn, I'll give you one example. Gasoline was rationed. So I was on uh, the high school football and uh, basketball teams, and we could no longer get enough gas to go to the games, the, the away games. So the dads pooled their ration stamps and got enough gas so that they could drive us in a couple of cars and that's how we got got to games, but it's and rubber rubber was uh, rationed, so uh, everything was recycled. And shoes people don't realize shoes were rationed, and my dad had a shoe store. So there are a lot of those uh, really crazy things that people don't realize now that uh, happened during World War II. That's amazing. I want to ask you a question that's a little bit selfish for for my own yeah. personal game, but I think it'll help the people watching too. Uh, so you've been through, you know, you've done a lot. You've operated billion dollar businesses. You were the commissioner of the LPGA. You, your one company, your media company owned Hanna-Barbera. You worked with Arnold Palmer. I mean, all of these things that you've done require a lot of attention, big decision making, fast decisions, a lot of information's thrown at you. It's a big time job. Yeah. You said you've been married since 1952. With all of those things happening, how did you balance your business life and still keeping your marriage as strong as it is? Well, it really is because my, my wife uh, uh, was part of every decision that I ever made. And uh, I remember when I was asked to take over CEO of TAP Broadcasting, and I said, what do you think? And she said, uh, if it's what you want to do, let's do it. And the things that we uh, became involved in were all things that, that she encouraged and shared with me. So, uh, and then, of course, she took over, hell, 90% of the job of raising the kids. Um, and 
as I said, I think in one of the podcasts that uh, when I became commissioner of the LPGA, she, uh, she went to most of the tournaments with me, became almost like a mother to a lot of the players. So I guess the quick answer is she's always been deeply involved in all of my decisions and my life. Is she someone that kind of keeps kept you grounded through the whole thing? Oh, she's, and this is her phrase. She is my most uh, honest critic <laughs> and you got to have that. Um, uh, and I don't mean she, not in an ugly way at all, but if she didn't agree with something I was thinking or planning to do, she would tell me, and I would always listen. <laughs> How did you meet? We met at Miami University in Ohio, where I was a junior and she was a freshman. And I'll make this quick, because um, it's a long story, but I was president of the student body at that time. One of my jobs was to uh, conduct the elections for the so-called freshman council. Well, uh, we had a meeting at which all the candidates for the freshman council were to come so that I could lecture them on how to run their campaigns. Well, I remember it was a rainy day, and uh, uh, as the meeting started, right just about the time that we were getting ready to start, this really cute gal came in the back of the room. She had her raincoat on and, and, and uh, so I went through the room passing out the handouts about how you run for freshman council. And I made sure to go back in back of the room and hand her, her, her sheet personally. Got her name and where she lived. I went back to my fraternity house and one of my fraternity brothers, uh, waited table in her dorm and I his name was Sam Badger I said Sam do you know Marilyn Brown he said sure she's a great gal real pretty gal and I said could you arrange a date with me so he set up a blind date that's the way it happened <laughs> did, did she rec obviously she probably recognized you and you showed up right because of who handed her the pamphlet oh yeah yep yep and it was all from there it was just smooth sailing yeah we, we, we never uh, went out with anybody else how long did you date before you got married? Probably about two years, maybe a year and a half. Yep. So you've been, since 1950, you've been together. It'll be 67 years, this, wow. uh, 68 years this That's year. It's amazing. So aside from balancing life and business with the family and all of those things, what do you think the, the biggest um, tip you would give someone to have, to keep a marriage happy for that long period of time? Patience and a sense of humor. <laughs> In one of our earlier conversations, I said the two qualities that I most treasure are patience and a sense of humor. And uh, I'd say that has a lot to do with a successful marriage. You're not going to agree all the time. In fact, one of the things that amuses me about so many of today's younger kids is uh, they figure if they have a disagreement, then they need to get a divorce. Well, <laughs> not the way it works. And uh, you're going to have a lot of disagreements. You're going to have arguments. Um, we've always tried, I think pretty successfully, to never go to bed holding a grudge. Um, that's not a bad rule to follow. Not always easy, but probably the right thing to do. That's fantastic advice. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, looking at your life as a whole, at this, at this point and looking back, I remember at the, at the end of one of our podcast episodes, you said you have no regrets. You wouldn't change anything. Right. What's the one thing that you've done in your life that you're the most proud of? That's a tough question because I, again, I'm, I'm proud of every career that I had uh, for different reasons. They were all quite different. But it would not be honest if I were to say the thing I'm proudest of is that I was commissioner of the LPGA or I was this friend of Neil Armstrong or whatever. Um, everything I've done, I'm proud to have done. Didn't always do it right. Didn't do everything perfectly. Uh, but I think maybe to put a little bit of icing on it, I'm I'm proud of the friendships that I made with equals and superiors and people who work for me 
uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the friendships. It's kind of sad now to be honest with you at age 90, because so many of our friends are gone, but we remember them vividly. And I think I'd have to say that that's probably what I'm proudest of are the friendships that we made. The relationships are so important. That's such a beautiful yeah. thing. And I'll ask you one more question before we, before we sign off. Cause I'm, by the way, I'll share you this, yes, this please. book. Yes. Here's who's that with Charlie. And uh, awesome. there are a lot of really funny stories in here about some of these famous people that I had the privilege of being around and uh, a lot of funny stories. So I That's think amazing. people would enjoy it. I was just, I was just going to ask you like, what's one moment in your life that you can look back on and say, man, if I would have made that decision differently, it would have been a whole different experience. Like, is there one pivotal point that you can sure. think of where, I mean, yeah, I'm sure there's certainly. a ton of them, but does one stand out more so than the others? That's easy to, to answer because if I had not taken up the opportunity to become CEO of TAP Broadcasting Company, but remained as a lawyer, none of these other things would have happened because TAP Broadcasting uh, led me then to, uh, to the LPGA, which led me to Arnold Palmer and so on. So that was the, uh, I, I'm sure that I would have enjoyed practicing law. Uh, I, had a, I, had a, I was with a wonderful firm. I had great partners and friends. Uh, so I would not have been unhappy. But uh, I think making that move into the business world and then the things that came later were clearly the most important thing for me. Was it hard for you to leave the law? I mean, I, I know you had the great opportunity and it was probably a lot thrown at you at once to be the CEO of Taft and it was exciting. But was there ever a time when, you know, because most people, when they become a lawyer, they do it to practice law because they love the law. And not practicing every day, did that ever, was that ever something you missed? I did miss it. I had to be careful, frankly, when I went to Taft Broadcasting to not try to be their lawyer because uh, that never works. But yes, I, I had a really good practice. I had a lot of really fun clients, clients like, uh, of course, Taft Broadcasting, but also the Play-Doh Company was one of my, was one of my clients. I had a lot of really fun, uh, the Cincinnati Reds, Cincinnati Bengals were both clients of mine. So I, I would have been a happy lawyer. Well, we're Steeler fans, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> boy, we had some pretty darn good games. And also, oh, we have. by the way, if you go back even a little farther, the rival was between the Reds and the Pirates. Oh, yeah. It was 70s. every bit as strong as the Bengals and the Steelers. Yeah, my dad, those were, like, those were his glory days. And so I've seen the films. I wasn't alive back in the 70s to be able to – and I'm sorry that I wasn't sometimes because I would have loved to see the Steelers, the Steel Curtain, and – the Reds and the Pirates. And, I, and now that there's no sports happening because of COVID, right. they're replaying a lot of those old games and I'm getting a chance to oh, watch yeah. them. And it's, well, I will never forget Roberta Clemente because he would, he would always do something that would, that would beat you. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was just an amazing, so sad that his career was cut short. But no, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. In fact, my dad was a rabid baseball fan. And as most men of that age were, because there was no other professional sport in those days. And he and his brother owned this shoe store in my little hometown of Nelsonville, Ohio. And if there was a particularly good game coming up in Pittsburgh or Cincinnati, they would just close the store and drive a car either to Pittsburgh or Cincinnati to watch the game. <laughs> That's awesome. That's amazing. That one had to be so much fun back in those days. Oh, and the well, big red was, machine, whew, were they he, good? Oh, uh, I happily, I. Pete Rose is a good friend of mine. Johnny Bench is a very good friend of mine. So I've been blessed in that way. And uh, I've been a great sports fan all my life. Uh, one of my dearest friends was Coach Paul Brown. Uh, some think the greatest coach of all time, certainly one of the top 10. Oh, yeah. So I, I've loved, I love sports, love being uh, involved as a lawyer for the two clubs as well. So yeah. I've, I've been a lucky guy. I watched a special the other day, actually, all about the life of Johnny Bench and his oh. life and his career. And he's got to be the best catcher that ever played. I don't think it's even close. No. Uh, there were others that were good. A uh, guy, actually, that nobody knows now, but a guy named Bill Dickey, who was a catcher for the Yankees. 
Yogi Berra was a great catcher, but nobody could do it the way John could do it. And he had, by the way, has the biggest hands you have ever seen. And one time during a game, I had my kids with me and they were teenagers. I took them down to the dugout, <laughs> introduced them to Johnny, and he shook hands with them. Both kids said they felt like it was a catcher's meat mitt <laughs> going around, going around their hand. That's Huge amazing. hands. But a really, really great guy. I've done a couple of podcasts with John that haven't been released yet, but uh, it turned out to be uh, very good. He's a, just a great guy. That's awesome. I know he had that trick where he didn't he used to hold eight baseballs in one hand. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I think but they have a commercial team, that they just made about that. Pardon me? They have a commercial on TV now I that know, he was in where he has hamburgers, I think. He holds eight yeah, bats. That's so right. funny. Well, the big red machine, of course, you, you know, when you live it, I, we were right – in the heart of it when we lived in Cincinnati. Uh, it's just hard to imagine a better better baseball team. You had, uh, you know, a Hall of Famer practically every position. Yeah. And uh, they, they, of course, they lost some like anybody else, but they were an amazing team. Well, that's how we feel about the 70 Steelers because oh, they yeah. had the Hall of Famer at almost every position the same that's way. Right. Like I always say, you know, the big red machine in baseball was like the steel curtain in football. I mean, good point. I agree with that. I agree yeah, with that. Very similar. What about what's what stories and what a way look? I mean, you met, brought up Roberto Clemente. You know, the All Star Game was here in Pittsburgh in 2006, and my dad and I got tickets. We went to the Home Run Derby. We went to the All Star Game, and we were at an event. We were actually what happened was I'll tell you the story real quick because it I think it's one you'll enjoy. We were leaving the Home Run Derby, and we we're on our way to get a cab to go back to our parking lot because you had to park way far away to yeah. get back to come home. And so we had to, he had to go to the bathroom. So we stopped at a hotel. It was the Sheraton at Station Square on our way. And as he was in the restroom, I said, I'm going to go get some water at the bar and I'll wait for you there. And as I'm doing that, I look across the bar and the Clemente's boys and his wife, who was still alive at the time, Vera, were there. My dad came out of the bathroom and I said, I think that's Clemente's kids. And he said, I mean, and he looked and he goes, yeah, it is. Let's go say hello. So we talked to him for a few minutes and they actually invited us to an event the following night, which was what we didn't know an invitation only event. It was opening the Roberto Clemente museum, which is now. Oh, in Pittsburgh. Wow. So we went to like the, it was the celebrity softball game during the day. Cause they had that for the all-star festivities and we didn't know what this was. So we go to this, it was at a firehouse. So we're thinking it's just gonna be a bunch of people, whatever. Yeah. So we show up and we're in like our game jerseys and shorts. And it's me and my dad, and my dad's cousin. And like someone answers the door, a big bouncer. And he's in like a, a suit and tie and everything. And he's like, who are you? And he's watching the door. And we said, well, Roberto Jr., it's said for us to come. He invited us last night. So he comes over the door, and he's like, oh, hey, guys, come on in. And he invites <laughs> us in. We go in. There must have been 30 Hall of Fame players there. Everyone was in, like, black ties except for us. They had this big spread of Puerto Rican food. The whole museum was open. His personal wow. photographer. I mean, right. that's a night I'll never forget. I was 21 years old. And they, they were opening barrels of wine that were Hall of Famers, personal collections, and just giving away drinks. And it was such an experience because, like, the Clemente kids were so, like, they, they just met us the night before. And they welcomed yeah. us to this party. We didn't know anyone else there. We <laughs> fell out of place. Nice. Oh, we God. got so many pictures, met so many people. It was just an amazing. And my cousin, actually, who's from Detroit, and he came for this because we're very close, he got to know – the guy who owned the winery. And so when he got wow. married, they made him custom bottles from Hall of Fame players collections oh with special labels on them and everything. So we still have yeah. those ties to the museum and the winery. <laughs> so I well, just... I'm going to tell you one of my favorite baseball stories. Uh, in the uh, 40s, I guess, the, uh, the Indians, Cleveland, was Cincinnati was not doing much then. And we were about a three and a half hour, three hour drive from Cleveland. So during the season, my dad would always check the schedule. And whenever there was a weekend series with the Boston Red Sox, he would put my brother and I in the car and we would go because we knew in a three or four game series, the odds were practically a hundred to one that we would get to see Bob Feller pitched to Ted Williams. <laughs> wow. And we did. <laughs> it was amazing. Just That's amazing. amazing. Man, he yeah. had to be the greatest hitter to ever live, Ted Williams. Nobody, the numbers yeah, nobody close, I don't think. Tony Gwynn. 
I think was close. Yeah, probably right. But I don't think he was quite on Ted Williams. Like he never hit 400. Mind, Ted Williams did. Keep in mind, Williams lost five seasons to the military. Yeah. Just imagine what yeah. would have happened if he had, and they're right in the in the heart of his career. So uh, who knows? I have to ask you one more question. I promise I'll yeah. let you go. And I, I want an unbiased answer if you can <laughs> give one. Pete Rose, should he be in the Hall of Fame? You know, I I can't answer that because it's it's. Well, may I tell you a story Please. about that? Yeah, I, yeah, that'd be great. Pete, um, when I was with the LPGA, Pete was doing a uh, radio show from his restaurant that he ran down in South Florida. So as I said, I knew Pete, and I got a call one day from his producer. He said, Charlie, uh, Pete would like to have you on the show, talk about the LPGA and so on. So I said, oh, it'd be great. I'd love to. So I go down and have a really good interview with Pete on uh, TV, I mean radio, from his restaurant. And as we got near the end of the interview, Pete said, uh, Charlie, we're going to go to commercial, but when we come back, I'm going to ask you a very, very tough question. And I want you to answer it honestly. And I said, what is it? He said, I'm not telling you now. So we go to commercial. We come back. He still wouldn't tell me. We come back to the show. And Pete says, Charlie, we're so glad the LPGA's here in, in South Florida. The gals are such great athletes. And uh, he said, by the way, I, I'm told that uh, – the LPGA Hall of Fame is the hardest Hall of Fame in sports to get into. And I said, yeah, Pete, that's right. He said, Why is that? And I said, well, because there, there are no, uh, no sports writers, no uh, fan votes. It's all based on the tournaments that you play and win and so on. So, oh, you mean uh, whether you get in or not is always based on your play on the field? And I uh -uh. said, you are a clever guy. And I said, yes, that's true, Pete. Nothing else matters. And he said, don't you think that's the way it ought to be in all sports? And the show ended right there. So that's an absolutely, totally true story. And so I guess I would say that Pete's been his own worst enemy, really, uh, because of the, the gambling thing. But if you measured it by play on the field, which I frankly think you should, yes. Now, another way to say it is if you apply a moral test, I think there might only be about 75 guys left in the Hall of Fame. Uh, obviously, I'm exaggerating, but uh, the answer to your question is play on the field is what ought to count. I agree with you. I was just curious because since you know him and you're, yeah, you yeah. know, you were the, the commissioner of the LPGA, what your take would be, but I agree 110%. The guy leads all time in hits. Yeah. I mean, how can you keep that out? And he's paid his, his dues. He's been held out for how long now? I would just like to see him be able to get in and experience that before he's gone. Because Well, and it, it also, Mario, was how he played the game. Yeah. I remember the first time I took my kids to the game, he – gets four balls, runs to first base. And I remember saying to the kids, now that's the way you ought to play the game. Uh, it was not only his, his uh, achievements, but the way he gave everything. Charlie Hustle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I would love to be able and you know, when, if that time comes, which I hope it does, that he gets inducted and he's able to be there. I'm going to say it's probably going to be the best induction speech <laughs> that anyone's ever given. <laughs> <before we're laughs> I'll tell, you, tell you one more story. Yeah. When he was right at the edge of breaking the record, I took my dad who was still living then, probably 90 then to a lot of games because we didn't know what game he was going to get him in. So we'd go about every night. And this one night, this, of course the stands were totally jammed every night. And my dad, goes down to our seat and he stands up and looks around and he says, you know, I'll bet I'm the only one in this whole ballpark that saw Ty Cobb play. <laughs> and I said, yeah, dad, you probably are. And he said, uh, you know, I think Pete's better. <laughs> I never forgot that. That's amazing. So, anyway, great well, fun. 
Yeah, Charlie, thank you so much for everything. I've so enjoyed this and the t- podcast episodes. If, you're, if people are watching this, then the podcast episodes are coming very soon. You'll be able to see those. If you're listening to this on the podcast, you can go listen to those right now. So go ahead and do that because the story, this Charlie story is just, it's mind blowing the things he's accomplished and how he's handled it and the wisdom that he shares. I want to remind you to grab his copy of his book, both of his books, uh, who's, who's That with Charlie and Total Anecdotal. Both of those books can be found at charliemeacham.com and also subscribe to 15 Minutes with Charlie, which is his podcast while you're there. Charlie, thank you again, my friend. This has been so much fun. We, let's definitely do it again soon. By the way, I should mention, I'm doing, I'm in the midst right now of doing an audible version of Total Anecdotal, which is a lot of fun because when you, you're reading anecdotes, uh, they're fine. But when I can tell them and laugh about them, it's, it's a lot of fun. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait for that. That's, that's going to be fun. And that's a reason why you should get the book to read it but also get the audible so you can listen and hear the stories behind them and hear the personality behind them. So thank you for sharing that. Thanks Mario. As I say, you're, you're really good at what you do. And that makes this a pleasure for me. Thank you, my friend. That means a lot. I appreciate that, especially coming from you. Thank you.